Hey, this is Ina, in with you in the fight back. I get a request to talk about the two-line struggle, or what exactly is a two-line struggle. And this is a concept that's largely associated with Mao. It can be found in Lenin in many respects as well, even Marx. But the idea behind it is, in a revolutionary party, or we can even argue in a revolutionary society as well, is that uh, within, say, the party, there are, tend to be two uh, various... Uh, groups, that there are those who are following a correct line based on proletariat or communist politics. And this is, of course, done, at least we, if you're a Maoist, as, as I consider myself, you would, cons you would uh, develop this through the Marxist course of uh, theory of knowledge, going to the masses, investigating, developing correct ideas, propagating them back until the masses accept them as their own, and so forth and so on. Uh, the mass line in many senses. And this is, of course, staying fused with the masses, fighting for their aspirations, fighting for communism. Well, there's a proletariat headquarters that's trying to advance communism, that's trying to stay fused with the masses, and trying to advance, you know, more forms of popular democracy and, and so on and so forth. Well, there's a second headquarters, a second line, which we call the bourgeois headquarters. And some would consider, like... They are following various erroneous ideas. For instance, they may be bureaucratic, commandist. They may, at various times, want to rely on market forces. And we saw a lot of this in China with the development uh, before and during the Cultural Revolution be between Mao and the capitalist rotors, such as Jiang Xiaoping, who Mao is, of course, looking for um, socialist forms of ownership, socialist um, consciousness, and the others are kind of more interested in developing capitalism and um, relying upon, say, the par party in command, like as a top-down institution of Mao, more from the bottom up. Now, these bourgeois ideas of, that form the um, capitalist headquarters in the party, again, are bureaucratic commanders. In many respects, you could say, in various socialist parties before World War I, there was, in a sense, a two-line struggle. There were sections of these parties, many of them were syndicalist or syndicalist-oriented. For instance, in the United States, we definitely had a two-line struggle in the American Socialist Party between, say, Eugene Debs, or probably actually more William Haywood, Big Bill, who was more proletariat, more focused on the working class, developing consciousness, uh, overthrowing capitalism, and and that would be the proletariat headquarters, also associated with the uh, industrial workers of the world. And then you have, say, the bourgeois headquarters in the American Socialist Party. And this would be the reformists who want um, to just get people elected. They just want a bigger party machine, commanders. They, they're really not interested in getting involved in union and worker struggles, except to the extent that they can control them from the top down. And this can be seen in various other socialist and communist parties throughout this period. And, of course... Um, in many respects, we can say reformists are still a bourgeois headquarters. Now, the Cultural Revolution, of course, um, is an attempt to uh, reforge the party, remold it in such, and reform communist politics in the party, get the masses involved, raise consciousness. And now those of you think, well, okay, you've got a bourgeois headquarters, you've got a proletariat headquarters, so they're going to come to head. So every erroneous idea in the party naturally leads to the bourgeoisie. Well, that's to ignore the whole other ideas of Maoism, of handling contradictions among the people, dealing with the mass line. Allow me to explain. Mao doesn't just say, anyone who disagrees with you, just take them out and shoot them. No, no, no. He's saying you got to talk, you got to engage, and he, uh, he uses the formula of criticism, unity, criticism. So, you have contradictions among the party. You have people who, at the very least, among a rhetorical level, are accepting communism. So those in the party, we, we debate with them, we try and win them over, we try and form unity on a new level. If we still disagree, we try, we still criticize, we still unify. So this whole mass line approach, it's not about getting control of the apparatus per se, although that, of course, can be important and depending on the struggle. But it's winning people over. It's getting people in. So if people have erroneous ideas, ideas that are form following a more bourgeois method, you, you, you debate with them. You argue with them. You handle contradictions among the people. This is the mass line. This is communist politics. 
And if you actually read Mao during the Cultural Revolution, he's saying, yes, overthrow the capitalist rotors in the party, Deng Xiaoping and, and others. But he's saying not everyone in the party. He's saying most of the party is good, relatively good. We can correct them. We can engage in criticism, self-criticism. We can win people over. And that's a great deal of what Mao is saying. He's saying, let's, let's do that. He's saying, even these capitalist roads, let's win them over. We're, trying, we're not trying to just bash people over the head. We're trying to raise people, raise people's consciousness, to build communism. And to do that, we need to win people over. And if we can't win them over, we need to, of course, solidify those who advance, who already accept, say, the proletariat line. Win over those who are wavering, the intermediate, as, as best we can. And those among the backwards, say, who are following a more bourgeois method, we need to say, well, we need to, if we can, win them over, raise their consciousness. And it can be done. People who have wrong ideas can develop right ideas. Is that so hard? Were we all born communists? No. But, of course, there are hardcores among the bourgeois headquarters, and sometimes you need to expel them outright. And, and of course, from the party and when isolate them if you can you know it's it's like that so this isn't in many many Maoists um, depending on the organization the country the time period they see this two-line struggle as just a clash you have a, a divergent idea well we're just gonna clash between you you need to be expelled from the party but I believe in and I believe Mao did too, that you need to engage in various forms of unity, struggle, unity, you need to use the mass line in party work, you need to not fight the enemy the same way the enemy fights you. You don't need to bash people over the head so much as to try and win them over, if possible, and if you can't isolate them, to um, expel them from the party, perhaps as a last resort. And you should actually read what Mao said during the Cultural Revolution. And of course, Mao is saying, Mao is about, again, interested in raising communist consciousness, raising popular power. And the proletariat headquarters um, has this, but it doesn't have it by right. It has it because it's following correct forms of practice. Its leaders are fused with the masses. They're, keep, they're going to them. They're learning their ideas. They're propagating them back. They have the trust in the masses, and they're holding up communism. And they're encouraging the masses to rise up to not so much – but for the masses to, in a sense, not so much for there to be leaders and led, but almost a synthesis of the two. The teacher is learning, and the student is teaching, as it were. And that's a great deal. And, and that's what Mao is doing. And just to quickly conclude, event, sometimes, now, ultimately, the Cultural Revolution in China was defeated, and capitalist rotors came in. Well, in that case, they're completely in control of China. China's pretty much become a capitalist country with communist coloring, if you were. It's really not communist. So in that case, well, then, of course, we need to overthrow them, and we need to – and it, but we use the mass line approach among the masses. We need to reform as best we can, form a vanguard party, and that kind of thing. And – in that sense, an uh, open struggle is called for because China has essentially changed its color from red to white. I know these notes may be a little um, jumbled and confused, but I hope you get the basic gist of what a two-line struggle is between proletariat headquarters and bourgeois headquarters and how they clash, but not necessarily how they clash, but how Maoists try and win people over, how it's not just necessarily a clash, but trying to draw the advanced, the intermediate, even the backward in, and isolating the backward and trying to advance with the masses towards communism. So this is Ina. Until next time.